Alan Bennett has been around in theatre, film and television for as long as anyone can remember. What makes you say that? He often says he seemed to start his career old, back in the 60s. So now, it's as though he has never aged. What seems nostalgic in his world is often the opposite. I don't think I'd like to be on your programme. I should be very boring. I am very boring. Good morning. But his sense of the absurd is all the more powerful for its familiar setting. And his empathy for life's promise, unfulfilled. I don't quite know what it is, but I'm not getting everything out of life that I should be getting, sort of feeling. But Alan Bennett knows his audience and increasingly delights in shocking them. What he'd been sucking was some snot. <laughs> Tonight, he's talking to me, Nicholas Heitner, on the occasion of his 80th birthday. We've worked together for more than 20 years. We've made movies together and staged his plays at the National Theatre. Lights up! It's a moment to look back at his astonishing career, his plays, films and his work for television. Brace yourself. <laughs> and his autobiographical writing, his diaries and memoirs. I'm working on a biography of the Queen. Uh, in the erotica section? Yes. It's a good time to look ahead, too, so he's agreed to a rare cross-examination. Not something he usually enjoys. And is, according to his own admission, an awful person to interview. <laughs> this is Alan Bennett at 80. Alan, I remember 10 years ago, exactly, we were in rehearsal for the History Boys, mm. and you were 70, and there was a cake, and there was happy birthday, and you're extremely grumpy <laughs> to be acknowledged at all. <laughs> so we're gonna pass in silence over the 80th birthday. Uh -huh. I, think, I think that might be the kindest thing to do. Yeah, no, it's the, it is the kindest, yeah. yes, that's right. Um, I'm gonna try and start back in 1968, just briefly. Mm -hmm. uh, your first play, 40 Years On, how do you think you've changed as a playwright in the nearly 50 years you've been writing them? I think I'm a bit more considerate of the audience than I used to be. Uh, well, in 40 years on, it didn't matter much, but uh, I think I used to write long monologues and uh, immensely long speeches uh, and uh, expect the audience to take them. Uh, whereas now, I hope I get on with it a bit more. Uh, and also, you, you tend to uh, give me a push in that direction. So I'm, I'm uh, kinder to them and also to the actors. I remember, uh, of course, it was partly because it was an unhappy experience, but uh, I remember uh, in my second play, we were getting on with Kenneth Moore. He balked at the length of the speeches uh, and I was outraged at the time, but now I would fully understand it. Really. Yeah, well, now you, you, you're you up for suggestions from anybody, really. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, uh, all, one of the things that's always amazed me is, I, I remember when we were doing Wind in the Willows, yeah. Uh, Tim McMullen and Adrian Scarborough, who played the yeah. two weasels, were constantly coming up with stuff which yeah. ended up in the play. Well, but that's jumping ahead, but in fact, Wind in the Willows was when I really first learned to write, as it were, on the hop. I mean, uh, I had to write as we went along, and uh, I'd never been able to do that before. So look, just in two minutes, we've covered mm. 40 years on a public school, mm. uh, getting on Labour MP in his <laughs> home life, the Riverbank, uh, there's a misperception um, fostered by um, a particularly uh, pompous critical brotherhood that you're at your best in Halifax. Um, <laughs> in fact, the material ranges far and wide, mm -hmm. and I thought we'd start um, with a clip from The Madness of King mm -hmm. George, which mm -hmm. started life at the National Theatre as The Madness of George III. Um, King George, in the first grip of his madness, has seized two of his small children from their beds. Uh, and is now pursued mm. by the Queen and the rest of the court uh, as he runs rampant through, uh, mm. through Windsor Castle. <laughs> I'm trying to think you should stay. <laughs> I have to talk in order to keep up with my thoughts. I thought he had taken you. Who's that? The other George, the fat one. You were not in my bed. I thought you had deceived me with the sun. Tell Elizabeth that was my bed. <laughs> Talk away. 
What do you do with him that you do not do with me, madam? Act it like pigs, the pair of you, huh? Those fat hands, that young belly, those warm thighs, the heart. Do you think that you are mad? I don't know. I don't know. Madness isn't such a torment. Madness isn't half blind. Madmen can stand. They skip, they dance. And I talk. Talk and talk and talk. I hear the words, so I have to speak them. I have to empty my head of the words. Something has happened. Something is not right. Oh, Charlotte. Oh. Oh. So that's Nigel Hawthorne and Helen Mirren. It was an amazing script, mm -hmm. an amazing play, an amazing screenplay. Is there something particularly about the royal predicament that fascinates you? Not really. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I've written about the Queen uh, uh, three times, I suppose. Uh, but that's because she's, she's such a wonderful character too. I mean, she also uh, carries her own plot with her, uh, uh, as in a way George III does. But um, the, the audience knows what she's like, so you don't have to do a great deal. You just have to slightly tweak it. Uh, you know, you say pages and pages of exposition. They know, they know where they are, they know who she is. And it also helps me, because one thing I'm not good at is plot, and, uh, and to be given a plot uh, is, is wonderful. I mean, uh, with George III, uh, it appealed partly because it was, it was dramatic and it was also sad and funny, but uh, I also knew how it, w you know, what, what was going to happen. Yeah. Um, let's have a look at the, uh, at the King Lear scene from George III, the scene where everybody realises he's getting better. How does the King? How does the King? <sighs> Lord Thurlow, sir. Oh, Her Thurlow. Majesty. Oh, the very man. Yes, we're reading a spot of Shakespeare. Willis, give him the book. Oh, the King Lear. Is that wise? I had no idea what it was about, sir. Now, I'm asleep, apparently, and Cordelia comes in and asks the doctor, that's Greville, here how I am. You see, off we go. Well, who's Cordelia? You are. Yes, but Willis can't do it. He's a fine doctor, but a hopeless actor. Yeah, off you go. How fares my royal lord? How does your majesty? You do me wrong to take me out of the grave. Thou art a soul in bliss, but I am bound upon a wheel of fire that mine own tears do scald like molten lead. Oh, it's so true. Pray do not mock me. I am a very foolish, fond old man. To deal plainly, Here I am not in my perfect mind. Is that the end, Your Majesty? Oh, good Lord, no. Cordelia, that Thurlow, dies, hanged, and the shock of it kills the king. So they all die. It's a tragedy. Very affecting. Well, it's the way I play it. Your Majesty seems more yourself. Do I? Yes, I do. Yeah, I've always been myself, even when I was ill. Only now I seem myself. And that's the important thing. I have remembered how to seem. What, what? What did your majesty say? What? I didn't say anything. Besides, Greville, you're not supposed to ask the king questions. You should know that. What, what? Get him ready. 
That was Nigel Hawthorne, John Wood, Ian Holm and Rupert Graves in, in The Madness of King George. And that reminds me of how addicted you are to historical truth. Uh, the, uh, the scene itself was an invention, but King Lear was uh, a favourite play of George III's. He did identify with King Lear. He loved Shakespeare. And they knew he was getting better when the verbal tics, particularly the what-whats, reappeared. So it's quite hard a lot of the time, to detach you from historical truth, even in the interests of drama. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's right, because that, the scene after that, then they, uh, they take him to Parliament and show yeah. him to Parliament, which, of course, never happened. Yeah. And I remember when you first suggested that to me, I thought, oh, no, you can't possibly do that. But then I thought, well, why not? Yeah. Um, so from Nigel Hawthorne right back to John Gielgud, uh, you have often organised your plays around whopping great parts mm -hmm. for wonderful leading actors, Gielgud, Guinness, Maggie Smith, Richard Griffiths, Nigel Hawthorne, mm -hmm. Francis de la Tour, something which I often wish um, the younger generations of playwrights would, would realise is a good idea. It's, it's always a good idea uh, to give great leading actors a, 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 some red mm -hmm. meat to chew on. Mm -hmm. Gielgud, uh, you lucked out really to get Gielgud for your very first play, 40 mm -hmm. Years On. Uh, maybe we'll just have a look at, uh, mm. at I think, the only clip the that only remains bit that's yeah, left, yeah, 40 years on. It. Gilgood is the yeah. headmaster. In this school, this Albion house, this, this huddle of buildings nestling in a fold of the downs, once the home of a long line of English country gentlemen, symbol of all that is most enduring in our hopes and traditions, 30 years ago today, Tupper, the Germans marched into Poland and you're picking your nose. See me afterward. Yes, sir. We're not a rich school. We're not a powerful school. Not anymore. We don't set much store by cleverness here at Albion House, so we don't run away with all the prizes. We used to do, of course, in the old days, and we must never forget those old days. But what we must remember is that we have bequeathed our traditions to other schools, and if now they lead where we follow, it is because of that. <laughs> My successor is well known to you all in the person of Mr. Franklin. Hey! When the governors want your approval of their appointments, Wigglesworth, I'm sure they will ask for it. Mr. Franklin has long been my senior housemaster, and now he is promoted to pride of place. <laughs> Doubtless the future will see many changes. Well, perhaps that is what the future is for. We cannot stand still, even at the best of times. Hmm. We cannot stand still, even at the best of times. Uh, your double-edged, ambiguous nostalgia runs through so many of your plays. Uh, you seem to be regretting a past which perhaps never even existed at the same time as wanting to knock it all away and, and, and look to the future. Well, I think 40 years on, I think with your first play, you tend to lay out a programme uh, without probably knowing it, but lay out a programme of the kind of thing that you're going to be writing, really. And, and certainly it does keep surfacing in, in stuff that I wrote subsequently. Um, but uh, watching Gilgood, uh, I'd forgotten how, uh, how easily he just went from, from uh, comedy to sadness and nostalgia. Uh, and, uh, and how effortless it seemed for him, though it wasn't, because he, we, he, uh, when they first suggested that he play the part, I couldn't believe that they, he would possibly want to do it, but then he did, uh, and to begin with, it was disastrous. I mean, he, uh, uh, he, uh, he wouldn't speak to the audience, and, the, and, and uh, 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 the whole form of the play depends on the headmaster treating the audience as an audience in watching a school play. But he wouldn't, he wouldn't, uh, he thought it was vulgar to talk to the audience. Um, but eventually Patrick Garland, who was directing, persuaded him to talk to the audience. Uh, and thereafter, he, he, um, he would scarcely talk to anybody else. Uh, but um, he also showed, uh, showed that, that uh, quality of just being able to turn on a sixpence and suddenly, um, Maggie Smith can do it as well, of, of being, uh, very funny one minute and sad the next. And um, uh, you'd see every night th this, uh, he's the famous, uh, I think they call the Terry Tears from, the, from the, his mother, I think, that, that he could cry 
uh, instantly. He'd be t chatting away in the wings and telling some endless story, which he was always doing, and then he had to step on the stage, uh, and within a few seconds he was uh, weeping, and, and the audience were weeping. Uh, and it was wonderful to see, uh, and to see, I suppose, at the start of my career, I, I, I've always uh, remembered it. It's a tragedy that uh, the whole thing wasn't recorded as it would be nowadays, but but it was wiped, you know. Yeah. And I think I remember you once telling me that Noel Coward came and mm. uh, and ticked him off one night because well, he wasn't that, trying hard enough. Is that right? Is yes. It? No. That's well, Noel Coward did come. He came on the night the before the first night he came, and um, we'd had a we'd had a really rocky ride at, in uh, rehearsals and uh, and in. Um, previews and, and on the tour because uh, John G was very, very slow to get his words. Uh, and he'd been through a bad period in his career he'd, and, and he had no confidence at all. And, um, and we went to Manchester with the, to open it on tour in Manchester in an empty theatre virtually. Uh, and, um, and he went on stage and he was so far from remembering his words, he sometimes didn't remember the names of the other characters in the play. Can I say, my parents saw it in <laughs> Manchester and I remember vividly, they came back absolutely scandalised. Worst play they'd ever seen. John Gilgood a disgrace. So I'm, I'm here to corroborate that. Yeah. No, it was, it was, and I was, uh, well, I was embarrassed, but at the same time, uh, I'd, I knew so little about the theatre. I thought, well, maybe this is what happens. You know, I wasn't sure that this, is, this was proper behaviour. But he, he didn't, he wasn't in the least bit embarrassed that the audience uh, saw him forgetting his words. They were in Manchester, you know, it didn't matter. And then the play then went to Brighton where he knew a lot of people and where the people who, uh, friend, friends of his began to filter in. And this made him pull his socks up a bit and then he began to remember his words. So that by the time he got to London uh, uh, two weeks later, um, he was just about, uh, you know, on top of it. And then Noel Coward came to see him uh, the night before it opened and wagged his famous finger at him and, and, and told him that it was a very good play and he was very good in it and, and gave him a real boost. And, uh, and it was fine then. But uh, it was a close run thing and, I, I, and I, I was very, very, very lucky that he did it, but I was very lucky altogether with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Albion House, the school in 40 years on, uh, is self-consciously a metaphor for mm. England. Um, I'm not sure the school in the History Boys is a metaphor for anything, but, but what is it about school that, uh, that, that makes it such a, uh, a suitable setting for your plays? Oh, I think it's, it's a, cl a close society, yeah. really. I think that's, uh, uh, that's what I like about it. Um, a monastery would be the same. Yeah. Uh, I think P.D. James sets things in monasteries, you know, and I think it's, it, it heightens the, the atmosphere and, and you're shut off from the world. Uh, and, uh, and it's a, a stadium for eccentricity. Yeah. Um, so, uh, well, it, uh, it's... A, it's it be it's a, a theatre within a theatre, as it were. Yeah, yeah. and school ma schoolmasters leading actors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, and schoolmasters overact and, uh, yeah. and um, ham actors, really. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. We'll go to the History Boys now, a scene where uh, Hector, the schoolmaster, is not overacting, mm. a, a, a scene where, where Hector perhaps unconsciously reveals himself talking about mm -hmm. um, the Hardy poem, Drummer Hodge, uh, to the unhappiest of the pupils, uh, um, Posner. Uncoffined is a typical hardy usage. It's a compound adjective formed by putting un in front of the noun or verb, of course. Unkissed. Unrejoicing. Unconfessed. Unembraced. It's a turn of phrase that brings with it a, a sense of not sharing, of being out of it, whether because of diffidence or shyness, but, but uh, holding back, not being in the swim. Oh, you, can, can you see that? Yes, sir. I felt that a bit. Now, 
the best moments in reading are when you come across something, a thought, a feeling, a way of looking at things that you'd thought special, particular to you. And here it is, set down by someone else, a person you've never met, maybe even someone long dead. And it, 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 it's as if a hand has come out and taken yours. It's wonderful to watching Richard, though. I, I you know, even, and also little, there's a thing. I, I don't think I noticed it when they were doing it, but um, Sam Barnett, uh, he just makes a tiny movement of his hand, uh, and you think maybe that he's going to take his hand, or, or one of them is going to take, well, the Hector's going to take uh, Posner's hand, uh, and it's that's in a way I think the the centre of the play. It is the heart of the play, and both of them are absolutely wonderful. Sam really nailed something there, which I think is, is, is very much a theme of your work, which is the way loneliness constricts so many of us, the way so many people find it difficult to break down the barriers that separate them from the rest of humanity. Mm -hmm. You always, it seemed to me, um, manage to kind of create a conspiracy of the lonely. You, you, you feel a thousand people a night acknowledging their own loneliness watching your plays. Mm -hmm. uh, these two characters here um, are profoundly isolated. Even Hector, mm -hmm. who sp spends the entire play performing to a classroom full of boys, he has real problems with proper human contact. Mm -hmm. um, expressing that through uh, the discussion of a poem always seemed incredibly moving to me. But in that scene, you do suggest that one of the consolations of a kind of inherent loneliness is literature. Um, you find fellowship in literature. What, what kind of literature do you find particular fellowship in? Oh. Uh, I'm very ill-read. I don't know if that sounds uh, over-modest, but it's quite true. But uh, it's too late, you know. <laughs> One of the advantages of being 80 is that I now know that I, I can't do anything about this, and so there we are. Yeah. I like uh, American literature more than I do uh, contemporary English literature. I don't feel any of the people writing in England can tell me very much. Uh, that may be unfair. Uh, I like Philip Roth, for instance. I don't know, in a way, um, writing seems to me spoils you for reading. That uh, if I'm trying to write something, I'll tend to read only, you know, uh, superficial stuff. I don't, I don't read anything which would make me think, oh, I can't do as well as this, which is, uh, I'm very much prey, prey to. Sorry. Well, I've always thought that one of one of the uh, one of the defining features of your work is that you invite empathy for people who, if uh, the kind of audience that comes to the theatre were to encounter in real life, they would run a mile for oh, them. Absolutely, and, <laughs> <laughs> and I would run a mile as well. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. is is writing in in some way uh, a means of, of of encountering stuff that you would not encounter, or you would or you would avoid encountering in life? Yes, it is, and it's also uh, it's also a way of doing things that people uh, wouldn't expect you to do, either in writing or in life. I mean, uh, I think of things for the characters to say or, or to do and I think oh, well they, people won't want, want to hear that from me and then I think well why not and particularly that's that as I've got older yeah. that's much more the case that I, I try and or I quite consciously um, outflank the audience or try and outflank my 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 audience as I see them yeah. I mean when uh, in the history boys um, Dakin the the, the um, the good-looking boy who who wants to impress the the master Irwin, um, 
and suddenly says, uh, are there any circumstances in which you might suck me off? I remember thinking of that and uh, making me laugh, but thinking, oh, I couldn't do that. I mean, and I could think, well, Mark Ravenhill could say that, I can't say that. And I thought, well, why can't I say that? Uh, and uh, and I, I do uh, consciously, uh, slightly shock my audience, but uh, it also slightly shocks me as well. What I was really wondering was whether any circumstances in which there was any chance of your sucking me off. It's the end of term. I've got into Oxford. I thought we might push the boat out. Anyway, I'll leave it on the table. I don't understand this. Reckless, impulsive, immoral. How come there's such a difference between the way you teach and the way you live? Why are you so bold in argument and talking, but when it comes to the point, when it's something that's actually happening, I mean, now you're so fucking careful. Is it because you're a teacher and I'm a boy? Obviously that. What you also do is you get an audience, despite itself, to root for Dakin oh. and to root for his success in that particular project, oh. which, is, which is an extraordinary thing for particularly a national theatre audience to want to do. Oh. I remember there was one critic who found the idea um, of a boy trying to seduce a teacher completely incredible. Mm. Um, and we put it to the vote. I, I don't think you were there <laughs> um, in the rehearsal mm. room. Uh, who here uh, tried to seduce teacher? And one member of that cast not only tried but succeeded. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, well, when I was writing it, uh, I, um, my agent at that time, Ros Chateau, uh, I was telling her about it and, uh, and uh, Somebody had said that this is very unlikely. She said, oh, nonsense, darling, I did. The art master at school? I mean, they, she listed various people. And, and so, you know, I was then encouraged by that. Yeah, mm. and the, but there's a real debate about education going on. In oh, yes. Boys, yes. Isn't yes. It? Uh, uh, mm. And where do you stand on that? Uh, I believe uh, very strongly, one of the few things I am passionate about is that uh, private education is wrong and that um, we'll only get somewhere in England when private education is abolished and we are all of us educated on, under the same system. There are wonderful things in private schools um, and uh, there are wonderful things in state schools. They should be brought together. It ought not to be difficult to do. It ought to be possible, for instance, at sixth form level uh, and, and then lead on from there. But uh, I can't see it ever happening. But uh, I, I do believe that very strongly. Mm. You have written about how there was a definite change in the way you wrote uh, when you were diagnosed with cancer, when, when you thought you were going to die. You said it acted like a laxative on you. Well, I put a spurt on, I think. I, 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 it happened that uh, when I was diagnosed in 1997, uh, it was, you know, I, I, they didn't... They said I had a 50-50 chance of surviving. The truth was I actually had a one in five chance. So I, I, I was very, very lucky. Um, but um, it meant that uh, by the time we got to the History Boys, which was 2004, uh, the shadow was receding. And so uh, I think that's some of that... Um, renewed life and indeed vigour, which is not a word I normally associate with myself, uh, fed into the history boys, mm. really. The next clip we've got is from um, one of your TV films from the 70s, mm. Sunset Across the Bay, uh, an old uh, Yorkshire married couple uh, about to retire to Morecambe, to the seaside. My mother was a great worker for the Conservatives. That was with having a shop. She was in the Primrose League. That seems to have gone now, all that. Empire Day. Empire Day is the 24th of May. Empire Day is the 24th of May. Empire Day is the 24th of May and his soul goes marching on. We're singing. It's three o'clock in the morning. 
I saw another fella come out of that end house. Oh, I. She's blonde now. Saw in the laundrette this morning. She smiled, but I didn't take on. Oh, she's right enough. Her husband's in Stockport. To break Mrs Appleyard's heart. It, uh, the couple are very like, uh, the man particularly, very like my parents. He was, uh, 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 Harry Markham, he was, uh, he was an amateur actor uh, all his life until he retired. He worked for Courtauld's and then he retired and, um, and he was in quite a lot of films. I think he was in one or two Loach films. He was, uh, he was so genuine, he was wonderful to see. But he's, he's, he's also like um, uh, Dad in uh, Cocktail Stick, uh, played by Jeff Rawl, which is at the other end of my career, really, 30, 40 years later. And watching Sunset Across the Bay, um, there were several lines which I noticed you used again in Cocktail Sticks. <laughs> <laughs> Your mum needing an all-over wash every, every, time she went to, every, every time she went to spend That's a penny. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, because he's... Because it was something my dad said, you see, yeah. that's why. Yeah. But you are pretty ruthless, or you have become more ruthless um, in the way you've used your parents, you've used the material of your own life to turn them into art. Well, I don't have anything else, that's, yeah. uh, that's the truth. Is. You know, a writer's life, or, uh, I mean, I didn't say it, Graham Greene said it, but it's very boring, and, uh, and even if you're, you know, like Graham Greene and take off uh, the jungles of South America. Nevertheless, most of the time you're just sat in a room trying to write. And but you do seem to feel equivocal about it. Uh, it it's, it's something that recurs in your work, a kind of um, beadiness about the way artists can prey on the ordinary lives of ordinary people. Yes, well, it's, it's, it, I do. I mean, uh, I suppose uh, it's a, an awareness of, of, of how you um, um, use people uh, when you're writing, it's a theme that runs right through the lady in the barn yeah. and isn't really resolved in a way, except by her, she resolves it when she dies and has the last laugh. And, and it also occurs in, in cocktail sticks when uh, my mother's line, a line that she said, is quoted, by I've given you some script. She said that, did she? Yeah, she yeah. said that, and uh, she would see my eyes light up if she said something daft or something that quotable. Uh, and the, uh, in those days, I used to keep notebooks, and I would run away and write it down in my notebook. I stopped keeping notebooks later on. I had so many, but um, but you know, she was quite right. She she did give me some script, um, and so did my dad, but in a much quieter way. You don't ever give yourself an easy time, though, in the way you you exploit the life around you. Uh, your play, Enjoy, imagines the last back-to-back -back in Leeds turned into a museum long before such things started to happen. It is actually quite a prophetic play and was much more successful when it was revived recently in the West End than it was uh, when it was originally produced. But you do feel distinctly uneasy about the way maybe you have embalmed a particular generation um, of the Yorkshire working class. I am uneasy about it, but I never thought of it as giving myself a hard time. Uh, it's just another instance of uh, something you can't resolve and you, it's, that's what the play is about, really. On the other hand, one of the things that surprised me looking back over your work was how often you come back to marriages which are maybe a little bit like your parents. Uh, the marriage in Sunset Across the Bay, the marriage between the King and Queen in, uh, in The Man of Sir George III. Uh, marriages which are secure and comfortable, but on the edge of being undermined, or maybe even comprehensively undermined, by boredom, by lust, by missed opportunity, or even madness. Or shyness, yeah. either. Yes, I suppose that's true, I, but I suppose that's all that comes particularly from my parents, who were very happily married, but who, and who didn't have any expectations, really, but at the same time, they felt that they wanted to break out somehow. I can see all that in myself as well, but um, it, all these are things mixed up with, with uh, when people say, why do you write? That's why I write, because there are all these unanswered questions, really. Yeah, but you, um, you seem to be drawn more to characters who miss their opportunities rather than characters who seize them. Yes, I suppose that's, that is true. I suppose, a lot of that will be to do with sex, I suppose, really. Um, think, looking back on your life and you 
the things you remember are the things that you didn't do. And that habeas corpus is all about that in a, yeah. in a farcical way. But uh, everybody feels that, I'm sure. Thora Heard's talking head waiting mm. for the telegram is maybe the, the most poignant expression mm. of exactly that. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's extraordinarily moving, Matt. It's, mm. That's uh, a whole life blighted by not going to bed, by not having sex with the, with the fiancé that went off and got killed in the First World War. And that's, uh, that, that, that comes up, it, it seems to me, over and over, even the end of the History Boys. During the play, you've got these 18-year-old lads whose lives are in front of them, and you allow them, all of them, to tell us at the end of the play what their lives amounted to. And none of them amounted to very much, really. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, I suppose, I suppose it's, it's my view of my own life, except that uh, I've been very, very lucky. You know, I'm, uh, I've met my partner quite late in life. Uh, and uh, and so the 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 last the last of my life is much happier than the first part, but um, it's also I think it's in my nature really to feel somehow uh, that uh, one's missed out. I mean, I uh, I think um, e even when I was seventeen, I was thinking that you know, yeah. um, it's a joke as well though. <laughs> Yeah, mm. it's surprising how few of the talking heads are a joke. Mm. I mean, those are, those are people right on the margin. Mm. There's, there's, the, there's the ripper's wife, there's, there's a, 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 a paedophile, mm. there's, there's this poor old lady who, who missed out on the one thing that she's convinced would have brought her happiness, mm. uh, there's the peeping Tom, and all of them absolutely um, naked, honest, and if not soliciting our sympathy, certainly winning it. Mm. Um, that seems to me to be a radical project to, to ask a television audience to go with those people. I, I mean, I can't say anything, I really. Uh, it's, it's, I hope it's true. Uh, but um, and they came out of the, well, not out of the blue, but they, they came like poems. Um, the, the first six, uh, I read the first, Talking Head I wrote, which was before the series, was A Woman of No Importance yeah. for Patricia Routledge, about a woman who is dying. And then I wrote these next six quite quickly. Uh, and then there was a gap and then I wrote another six. And, I've, and people say, uh, uh, people write to me and say, uh, would you like to come and talk to us? Perhaps you could write a Talking Head and, <laughs> and you know, <laughs> if I could just run it off. And, and there's nothing I would like more, you know, but I, you know, they, they came uh, uh, from, I suppose, from deep down, but I, I, I uh, it's not there anymore. I can't write them. Yeah. Thora Heard, like John Gielgud and Alec Guinness and later Richard Griffiths and Nigel Hawthorne and Maggie Smith. She was a she was a real muse. For you. Yes, she was a consummate professional. She uh, she did a lot of rubbish, but whatever she did, she did it with her whole heart. And she was also uh, an old-fashioned actress in the sense that when she came to rehearsal to radio rehearsal in Broadcasting House, she would come fully uh, in all the full gear, you know, she looking very glamorous as she saw it and she had a white coat and a yellow hat and she'd say, I've come as a poached egg. <laughs> uh, but, she, you know, she, she dressed up for the rehearsal because that's what actresses did. Uh, and I like all that. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, she had an enormous respect, rather like my parents, for the written word. Uh, and, uh, and if you were a writer, that was something in her eyes. And um, in Waiting for the Telegram, it starts off with a, uh, her, a speech and she said, uh, he sent me this uh, play and um, in the first speech, I mean, honestly, I, I don't know. I mean, Alan Bennett is the only person I, I'd, uh, I'd say a swear word for. <laughs> And uh, and I thought this was no swear word, you know. And then I realised uh, the swear word she meant was penis, which occurs in the first speech, uh, which was a swear word in Thora's book. But um, it, it was quite a risky script from her point, a risky script from her point of view. She says, Violet, I have to ask you this: Was the penis erect? I said, Nurse Babdy, that's not a word I would use. 
She said, erect. I said, no, the other. She said, well, Violet, you've had what we call a stroke. You're sometimes funny with words. I said, I'm not funny with that word. She said, things have changed now, Violet. Penis is its name. All the other names are just trying to make it more acceptable. Language is a weapon, Violet. We're at war. I said, who with? She said, men. Right out there on the margins are the spies who you've come back to several times. There's Alec Guinness in The Old Country, Alan Bates in An Englishman Abroad, and there's also your play about Anthony Blunt, A Question of Attribution. That's uh, James Fox and David Calder in A Question of Attribution. What is it about spies? Why have you come back to them over and over? I don't know, people say it's because I'm gay, but I don't, it never seemed to me that there was much connection between that, even though so many of the spies were. Um, I don't I liked uh, the notion of, um, of the Cambridge spies uh, betraying their class. Uh, it's, it's an ambiguity about England as well, about being in, in many ways uh, very conservative with the small c about England, and yet knowing there's so much wrong with it that spying is excusable because they thought that they were doing something to improve things, really, to, um, to uh, they, they were morally on the right side. They didn't, uh, none of the spies uh, spied for money. And uh, the treason they're supposed to have committed doesn't nowadays seem to me to be a, a, a particularly um, important crime. Um, and uh, the, you know, the Edward Snowden stuff, uh, I'm wholly on his side, really. Uh, that's by the way, but anyway. Uh, yeah. um, and in Habit of Art, you work through um, that tension between concealment and revelation, between, uh, between letting it all hang out, which is W.H. Auden, and deriving fantastic dramatic power from holding it all in, which is Benjamin yeah. Britten. That's, that's at the heart of that play. Auden talks about how his later work is more scrupulous than his earlier work, and he berates Britain later on in the play for not being fully honest uh, in his operas. And we've got a clip from that now. There are some writers who set their sights on the Nobel Prize even before they pick up the pen. Elias Canetti is like that, and I'm afraid Thomas Mann. Never underestimate the role of the will in the artistic life. Some writers are all will. Talent you can dispense with, but not will. The will is paramount. Not joy, not delight, but grim application. What are we talking about? <laughs> Thomas Mann, Death in Venice. Two of his sisters committed suicide, as did two of his sons. He was a genuine artist. Just as it happens. Yes. Where's Peter? I said, Toronto. <gasps> do you repeat yourself? Well, I... They tell me I do, but it's not my fault. They treat me like an oracle, and that's what oracles do. They repeat themselves. <laughs> arid? What? Your music? I wouldn't have said it was arid. Detached, dispassionate, attuned something of an indulgence, but not arid. <laughs> you always mean what you write. But in the sense that Shostakovich sometimes doesn't. Yes, I think so, don't you? Well, I do now. I didn't always. As a young man, I used to leave meaning to chance. If it sounded all right, I let the meaning take care of itself. That's why I find some of my early stuff so embarrassing. Well, in those days, I'd ask you what a line meant, and rather than explain it, you'd just write another. Very naughty. Except that now I, I, I'm more scrupulous. I, I make an effort to tell the truth, and people say it's dull, and my early stuff was better. That's uh, Richard Griffiths as Auden and Alex Jennings as Benjamin Britten. Uh, do you feel that your later work has become more open and more scrupulous? Yeah, oh, yes, I do. I, do, I, don't, I don't care what people think about me. And I, I don't... Uh, uh, my objection about people knowing more about one's private life was that I didn't want to be put in a pigeonhole. I didn't want to be, you know labelled as gay and that was it, you know. Uh, I, I just wanted it to be, you know, I wanted to be my own man, as it were. Uh, and 
a habit of art, it feels almost as if Auden is who you want to be and Britain is who you fear you are. Auden is mm. out there soliciting blowjobs off rent boys and, <laughs> and mistaking respectable biographers for the rent boy and, and Britain is uptight and, and, and restrained. But Britain didn't really loosen up as he got older. I mean, he, uh, he remained uh, the, uh, very much as he'd always been. Uh, and again, it's an unresolved thing which you have to write the play to in order to resolve, really. Yeah. And as you say in Cocktail Sticks, which is a, your recent one-act play, um, your most recent one-act oh. play about yourself, you don't put yourself in what you write, you find yourself yes, there. I think that's absolutely true. In a way, nowhere is that, uh, is that more marked than in The Lady in the Van, which is uh, ostensibly about Miss Shepherd. Um, certainly in the play, as much about Alan Bennett as it is about Miss Shepherd. Uh, we never filmed The Lady in the Van, but exists obviously as a memoir. I wondered if you would read mm -hmm. something from it mm -hmm. um, and then we could talk about yeah. how we might film it if we do. <laughs> Very good. <coughs> uh, I maybe should explain um, that um, Miss Shepherd was a, a, a woman who lived in a van in the street I lived in in Camden Town and um, at some point uh, when the council put down yellow lines and I said, well, she'd better bring the van into my garden, which is quite small, thinking this would be um, three months or so, and it turned out to be for 15 years. Anyway, this is uh, uh, something that happened in 1975. Miss Shepherd rings, and when I open the door, she makes a beeline for the kitchen stairs. I'd like to see you. I've called several times. I wonder whether I can use the toilet first. I say, I think this is pushing it a bit. I'm not pushing it at all. I'll just do the interview better if I can use the toilet first. Afterwards, she sits down in her green mac and purple headscarf, the knuckles of one large mottled hand resting on the clean scrub table, and explains how she has devised a method of getting on the wireless. I was to ask the BBC to give me a phone-in programme something someone like you could get put on in a jiffy. Perhaps there would be gaps filled with nice classical music. I know one, Prelude and Liebestraum by Liszt. I believe he was a Catholic priest. It means love's dream, only not the sexy stuff. It's the love of God and the sanctification of labour and so on, which would recommend it to celibates like you and me, possibly. Shocked at this tentative bracketing of our conditions, I quickly get rid of her, and though it's a bitter cold night, open the windows wide to get rid of the smell. Well, <laughs> we, um, we did the play, you wrote a, you wrote a play based mm. on your memoir uh, with Maggie Smith, and now, nearly 15 years later, uh, we're trying to pitch it as a movie, we're going around with our begging bowls. Maybe what I could do is, is tell you some of the things that are confusing the movie people, <laughs> because we could work it out here in front of the camera. Uh, those who don't know the story remain confused about what on earth you were doing and why you let her in and why you let her stay there. Well, it wasn't a one-off decision, as it were. The decision I made was, as I said, that she could come in for three months or so, uh, and then she would go on and with the van and go somewhere else. Uh, her will was, was immensely strong, and she was determined to stay. Um, and mine, I, I just, it was too much trouble to get rid of her, really. And uh, that, that's one way of looking at it. But I think it's also laziness. I just, you know, it would have been such a fag to try and get rid of her. Uh, she probably had squatter's rights after a year or so. You, um, you're pretty ruthless about yourself uh, in the memoir and in the play. In the play, two actors played you because you divide yourself into uh, the writer and the landlord. Mm -hmm. The landlord is the bulk of it, the major character, the, the householder who allows this old lady to drive her van into his drive and stay there the writer um, who occasionally separates from the landlord, initially reluctant to have anything to do with this ridiculous story. He's got enough old ladies in his life already. He's writing about his mother, he's writing about all his old aunties. Mm. 
the writer eventually realizes that this is the best material he's ever going to get. <laughs> and he then exploits her. And I think one of the things you never quite satisfy yourself about in the story, and I hope in the film, is who is the more ruthless of the two of you? The writer who is going to turn her into a national myth, or she who takes 14 years of your life by living in your drive? I think uh, she's probably is more ruthless, <laughs> I think. I think she never gave an inch. Um, but the notion that uh, I invited her in in order to write about her is so ludicrous. I mean, Richard Ingram has always took this view in private eye, uh, and it's so ludicrous. Uh, as who would do that anyway? Yeah. But um, but she she had an iron will. Uh, she never at any point said thank you for anything, uh, and uh, I didn't want to be thanked. But at the same time, if she had thank you it would be it would have been a chink in her armor and she never uh she never exposed that chink you know and, and it's it's why she survived living on the street really and had survived all her life and, and a quite a dramatic life it was because uh she uh, I, and so i ended up slightly when i found out the facts of her life thinking well she's had a much more dramatic life than i've had uh, and so that, uh, in a sense, I became almost envious of her. It's absurd. It, it was, I mean, as I say in the book, it's, it's like, it was like Dickens when she died, that, uh, that you know, the, the whole thing, uh, you could make sense of her life when all the facts were laid out. Yeah, mm -hmm. and amongst the things we're trying to do at the moment is to engineer the movie so that the revelations are spread mm -hmm. through its two hours rather than all come tumbling well, out the Well, it's easier to do that in, on film than it was on stage. Yes. You couldn't really have done it on stage. But to return to somewhere near where we began, um, you may be 80, but we're still doing new stuff, so there's lots to come. Well, I don't think there's lots to come. I'm, I'm, the, there's that to come, all being well. Yeah. Uh, I find it... Uh, Harder and harder to write, but then I always have found it hard to write. So I'm at the stage of, of covering reams and reams of paper and not getting anywhere. But that's always been the case. Um, people, you say it to people, I, I never really believe in writer's block. I think all writing is writer's block, really. It's always so hard. But uh, I don't think it's tragically hard or anything like that. It's just, you know, it, it's difficult. Um, but uh, people say, oh, well, you've done so much. And uh, it doesn't seem to me I've done so much. But it's not. The stuff you've written isn't like, doesn't seem to me like upholstery. It's not something you can settle back in and think, oh, well, I did that. And I've done so many plays and so on. Uh, and, 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 and it's not co a comfort that you've done all this stuff. Uh, it's just a rebuke as much as anything else. You think, well, I can't do it now. And writing is about now. It's about, about what you're doing this morning, you know, what you're sitting at the table, staring out of the window and trying to do. And, uh, and that's still the situation now, whatever age I am. Well, I'm looking forward to as much more as you care to write. Oh, well. <laughs>